the Boy Scout motto, be prepared, underscored the significance of readiness. The Scout Law delineated the attributes a Boy Scout should embody, reliability, loyalty, utility, amiability, courtesy, benevolence, compliance, joviality, frugality, courage, hygiene, and deference. However, the law appeared contradictory as it referenced innocence, foolishness, ignorance, and gullibility. Nick found himself puzzled upon encountering an email on his wife's iPhone. Typically, he refrained from accessing anything on her phone, a practice she was cognizant of, thus foregoing additional security measures. Being a Boy Scout, he respected others' privacy. However, with his wife about to depart, Nick couldn't recall the name of her hotel. Though she had mentioned it previously, he hadn't paid heed, fearing discord. Their disagreements had escalated recently. The impending trip marked their longest separation since their wedding five years prior. Determined to infuse romance, Nick contemplated a gesture, such as sending flowers. He wanted to show his love for the woman he adored by sending her flowers while she was thousands of miles away from him in Paris, the city of love. Despite the romantic setting, he knew that her heart belonged to another person, Dwayne, who was also on the same trip. Curiosity got the better of him, and Nick entered his wife's phone password, their wedding date, and discovered a series of personal emails exchanged between his wife and Duane. They discussed walking along the waterfront after dark, taking a boat ride along the beach by moonlight, and spending the whole night making passionate love. Almost as shocking as their romance was the discovery that Nick's wife, Linda, and her lover, Duane, were using their work mailboxes to exchange messages. She, like Duane, should have been more careful. Like Nick, Linda was also a lawyer, and Duane worked as a paralegal at the same firm as Linda. The three of them had the experience of carefully analyzing documents in major lawsuits. In such cases, large teams of lawyers searched through countless emails in search of possible clues. Usually, scandalous intrigue appeared in such cases, which forced the legal team to assess its significance for the case and develop a strategy on how to minimize any negative consequences. Nick didn't pay attention when Linda informed him about the trip and the hotel where the team was staying. His intuition told him that something was wrong, although at that moment, he could not pinpoint the cause. Five years of experience as a lawyer had honed his listening skills and made him more sensitive to deception and half-truths. When Linda first talked about the trip, Nick felt that something was wrong. She described it as a boring arbitration process that would take up all their time, leaving no opportunity to explore the sights of the city. She spoke dispassionately, avoiding eye contact, knowing that Paris is one of Nick's favorite cities. They often discussed the possibility of visiting it. Together, but Linda had never been there. Nick was puzzled by her answer, as he had never imagined such a disappointing outcome. The subject of the letter he was reading now pierced his heart like a sharp dagger. Why don't you just get rid of that Boy Scout so we can spend more time together and not worry? Duane wrote this message the night before. I feel safe with him, Linda replied. So why are you having fun with me behind his back every chance you get? You're better in bed. Nick was confused, not knowing what to do next. All he could think of was to forward all the emails to his address and print the message exchange in case of any doubt. His initial reaction as an experienced lawyer was to preserve the evidence. After printing and saving the emails, and clearly realizing his intentions, he took a pause to consider the possible consequences before acting. Critical thinking was one of the key aspects of his legal profession, where intelligence was valued above physical strength. Time was running out because Linda had gone for a run and would be back soon. Before indulging in further thoughts, he needed to complete the business he had started and find a place to live. But this place wasn't meant to be a romantic gesture. The reason why he needed this particular information eluded him, but he was sure that it was extremely important. Perhaps a suitable base would be a place next to the Eiffel Tower, somewhere within walking distance of the International Chamber of Commerce, where Linda and Duane were supposed to conduct arbitration proceedings with their colleagues. If they could find free time for meetings unrelated to work, after finding a hotel, he quickly found information on the internet about the rules of divorce in Virginia. Although he remembered some details from the bar exam he took five years ago, he decided it would be wise to check them out. Adultery was cited as a reason for divorce and could affect issues such as alimony and property distribution. Nevertheless, proving adultery is fraught with difficulties. One of them was the concept of connivance, if a person discovered infidelity but decided to resume an intimate relationship and live together, this could serve as her protection. 
He needed to leave the house urgently without entering into any confrontations, yet he planned to surprise her later with complete shock and awe. Without any unexpected problems, he was determined to take control of the situation in their marriage, even if it meant lying, which was contrary to his moral code. He considered it a necessary strategy in this battle. After all, as Churchill said during the war, truth is precious and it must be protected by a shield of deception. Now, the exchanger has been acquitted, especially since none of his false phrases were uttered under oath. Going into the bedroom, he hurriedly began to pack his things. In the blink of an eye, he packed everything he needed and put his suitcases at the front door. Among the important documents were bank statements, credit cards, the 41st bank account, IRA account, car documents, payment receipts, mortgage documents, and Linda's last student loan balance. When she returned from her run, he heard her in the kitchen. Coming out of his basement office, wanting to look tired and disheveled, he deliberately assumed this look. When he saw his wife, her shoulder-length brown hair was tied in a ponytail, and she looked attractive. Unfortunately, he found her repulsive. He had already come to terms with the fact that there was no more love in their relationship. I'm going to Paris, he announced with a grim smile. Linda's face turned pale, all the color drained out of it, and her once bright blue eyes began to look dull. What? She gasped for breath. Her shock quickly passed after she heard, Paris, Virginia, Nick spoke up. Sven just called. We have to testify in the insurance case and prepare a witness. We lost the coercion case, and the judge is furious. The investigation deadlines have been missed. I'll be traveling for a few weeks. Maybe I'll have the opportunity to visit you from time to time, Nick said. Linda expressed sympathy, saying, poor thing. Nick playfully suggested, maybe your company is recruiting employees. Then he added, I'd rather work in your Paris. Linda looked worried at first, but then she smiled and said, send me a resume. Who knows, maybe we will consider your proposal. It was all a joke because Linda's law firm was ahead of Nick's in the rankings. Feeling a pang of guilt, she tried to hug him, but Nick quickly dodged her and headed back to his office, leaving her standing with her arms outstretched. The visions of him hitting her in the face kept coming back, and he wasn't sure he could keep them under control. Upstairs, Linda asked about dinner plans. I won't be able to stay for dinner. I'll grab a bite on the way. Sven is furious and wants me to leave immediately, he replied, busily pacing the kitchen. Worried, Linda walked him to the door while he packed his things. She pursed her lips for a goodbye kiss and expressed concern when he said he had a sore throat. I may have caught a cold, he explained. I don't want you to get sick. As he was loading the car, Linda asked, when will you be back? He replied, probably not before Friday. After Paris, we're going to Roanoke, and next week we have to go to Baltimore. He couldn't shake the feeling that he was getting more and more paranoid, and he could almost hear the gears turning in her head as she avoided his gaze. She seemed to be already considering what opportunity his absence might bring. Waving his hand, he pulled away from the driveway, hoping that she would think that he was just busy with work and annoyed that he was disturbed on Saturday. He was running out of energy for the charade, but he sensed that she was already plotting to invite Duane to her place. Nick drove until he got to the nearest mall where there was a cafe. Being a typical lawyer, he found clarity in writing everything down. Sipping his coffee, he began to write down the cases that required his attention. It suddenly dawned on him that he had never thought about reconciliation. For him, only retribution was on the agenda. Only the scale of the retaliation remained unclear. Suddenly, the phone rang, and an unfamiliar number appeared on the screen. With a note of irritation, he replied, yes. The voice on the other end introduced himself as Sam Granger and explained. Granger said that he had learned the number from the internet. He specializes in buying old houses to demolish them and build mansions in their place. He admitted that his work does not always meet with approval but stressed that people usually change their minds as soon as they receive a check from him. Granger's words came out quickly, leaving Nick in a daze. The cozy house did not seem old to him, so why demolish it? As his thoughts raced, he realized that Granger was really offering to buy this land. Granger mentioned plans for the construction of a shopping center but admitted that the construction dates had not yet been determined. He stressed the importance of a quick deal to make a profit and offered a good price if Nick and his wife agreed to sell the house. Nick suppressed a grin with difficulty. It was Linda who chose the house for them shortly before they tied the knot. The old ranch-style house had a stunning courtyard that bordered a forest and a bubbling stream. 
despite its proximity to major highways, the house seemed secluded and peaceful. What finally captivated Lendo was the charming treehouse located in the courtyard directly opposite the window of the master bedroom. She liked that it was a ready-made house for children, and Nick was attracted by the affordable price and proximity to the subway. The convenience of a 30-minute train ride to work solved all their problems. Mr. Granger, I will be out of town for a few days, so I may not be able to provide access to the property. Just call me Sam, and I don't need to see the inside of the house. As I said, the house is in poor condition, and I have already inspected it from the outside. Can we meet Sunday morning? Sure. For your information, I will most likely conduct a power of attorney transaction with my wife since she is currently busy at work. Good. I will provide you with the necessary form. Nick wrote down the address and began to imagine how the plan would be implemented. She trusted her Boy Scout, didn't she? Linda did not know that Lord Baden-Powell based his movement on military intelligence, focusing on skills such as stealth, cunning, and self-confidence, including ambushes. She would be caught off guard because she would not see that she was being approached until it was too late. But first, it was necessary to conduct reconnaissance. To do this, he put an empty coffee cup on the table and went out to the car to have some privacy. He dialed the number on his phone. When the call was answered, he immediately got down to business. Frank, I need a favor, he said. Frank Berry, a private investigator, had been working in the field of corporate law for five years but at the same time did not forget to provide gratuitous assistance to those who needed to resolve legal issues. This not only corresponded to his personal values of being a compassionate and responsive person but also gave him valuable court experience that was not available in his regular job. One of the law students asked Frank to help in a difficult divorce case when his stepfather was accused of abusing his stepdaughter. Despite the lack of urgency on the part of the police, Frank's evidence eventually led to the man's release and a quick resolution of the divorce issue. Frank listened as Nick explained what he had learned. Do you think your spouse will invite him to her bed today? Is she really that arrogant? She was one of the best students in her class at the Faculty of Law. She thinks she's incapable of making mistakes. I'll handle this myself. I owe you. Rivera's divorce case has brought me positive publicity. The phone is ringing non-stop. Thank you, Frank. Nick expressed his gratitude. By the way, there's a treehouse in the backyard that you might need. It has a direct view of the bedroom, and she likes to leave the curtains open. It used to annoy me. To reach your destination, you need to make your way through the forest and jump over a stream under cover of darkness. There are no barriers or dogs here. There is a service road on the other side where you can park safely. Thank you. I plan to install a camera on the street aimed at the facade of the house to keep an eye on comers and goers. Excellent. Harry will handle your divorce, right? I suppose you want to get a divorce? Yes and yes. Good. I'm aware of his interest in sworn testimony in the reporting process. If you're right, we'll find out soon enough. Then Nick called Harry. Is this about the law school reunion, Nick? I've already received five calls offering to donate to their foundation. No, I need to enlist your help. Linda is being dishonest, and I want to expose her. After Nick brought him up to date, Harry replied, Come back tomorrow. I understand that today is Sunday but I still have some business to settle at the office, so I was just about to leave. Let's act right now. You seem to understand that adultery is unacceptable. Frank provided convincing evidence of adultery. The most difficult aspect will be negotiating a financial settlement. She is a lawyer at a large firm, so she will have the resources and support to delay the process. Nick assured him, leave it to me. I believe we can handle this calmly and rationally. You won't take revenge, okay? Let's see what you can come up with, was the last, more cautious reply. Hello, Maggie, this is Nick. The silence on the other end of the phone was overwhelming. You're a sly fox. Glad to hear from you, dear, after all these years. What do you need, Nick? After all these years, I need your help. I thought Linda was your right-hand man. It's about Linda. She has become a traitor. I'm in shock. I can't believe it. How stupid of her. Have you noticed that all this is enclosed in quotation marks? I can't provide emotional or physical support right now. I have a relationship. I'm sure he's happy with you. I apologize for our past actions and how they affected our friendship. 
I'm sorry that I let Linda come between us and cut you out of my life. Now I need your help as a friend. What can I do for you, Nick? He told her everything. There was a brief silence on the line and then laughter. I agree, she finally said, still with a hint of a smile in her voice. You always knew how to make me laugh. Thank you, Maggie. When everything settles down, you will have to introduce me to Mr. Husky so that I can congratulate him on his excellent taste and invite you both to dinner. It's a date, she replied. Needing a place to hide and plan, he checked into a hotel in Fairfax, away from the usual places he frequented with Linda, so that he would not be noticed. After checking into the hotel, he went to have a snack. Although he was not really hungry, he understood that it was important to have something in his stomach to absorb the alcohol he was about to consume. El Mariachi Restaurant was located across the street from the hotel. When the waitress brought him to the table, he noticed the bartender watching him, but he pushed the thought away because he had more pressing problems at the moment. Judging by the menu items, the restaurant was trying to pass itself off as Mexican, which most Americans do not recognize. He decided to accompany the meal with cheap tequila, knowing full well that the hangover the next day would be severe, but considering it a necessary part of the cleansing process. The waitress surprised him by bringing a bottle of high-quality tequila from the top shelf, indicating that the bartender had sent it as a gesture of goodwill. Nick greeted the bartender and poured himself a drink, watching as he moved on to serving other customers. Nick didn't immediately remember how he knew this bartender. He had seen him at Rivera's divorce hearing and at the criminal trial that Nick attended. The bartender always sat alone in the last row, and no one sat next to him. One day, Sona, his client's daughter, hugged him. When asked who he was, she hesitated and just said he was a family friend. Nick ate in silence, making notes in a notebook and sipping tequila. When the waitress cleared away the plates, he went to the bathroom. As he walked, he swayed slightly as if he were on a ship, leaning against the wall for support. He quickly finished and returned to the table, trying to look confident. To his surprise, he found that the bartender was sitting on the opposite side of the table. Glad to see you, Senor Nick, he said warmly and held out his hand for Nick to shake enthusiastically. Nick sat down at the table and waited for the bartender to say something. I still haven't thanked you properly for helping my cousin escape this terrible marriage, the bartender said, cutting off all attempts by Nick to downplay the significance of his actions. He was brutally attacked in prison. Did you know about this? Yes, I've heard about it. They believe that he will never be able to walk or eat properly again. There was a slight smirk on the bartender's lips when he told Nick about it. Nick flinched as he met the bartender's gaze. I didn't hear that, Nick replied. The bartender just shrugged his shoulders. Old news, he said. What brought you to El Mariachi alone on Saturday night? Where's your beautiful wife? Nick stared at the bartender, who was still smiling. The smile on the bartender's face was not mocking but rather knowing. Nick was puzzled by this strange question and wondered how the bartender knew he was married then. It dawned on him that Linda had surprised him by attending one of his hearings and kissing him afterward. The bartender must have seen it all from the courtroom. We have some problems with her, Nick admitted, seeing no reason to cheat or hide information. Does she like talking to someone else? The familiar smile flashed again. Nick was stunned and speechless. I may not be a lawyer, Don Nicholas, but I know that if you want to keep a secret, you shouldn't write it down and leave the paper in plain sight, the bartender remarked, gesturing at Nick's notebook. The notebook described in detail the elements of adultery, sketches depicting a violent attack against Duane, Linda's name circled with a slash, and a to-do list with the chilling phrase burn this cheater. Nick shrugged, acknowledging the low level of operational security but not compromising confidential customer data in his current predicament. He was thinking about what he really needed. Senor Nick, what would you want more than anything in the world besides money if you had the opportunity to take revenge? Without hesitation, Nick answered, I want to deliver a crushing blow, to break her nose and darken both eyes. She has an amazing face with expressive eyes. I want to ruin them. The bartender laughed and shook his head. My friend, you're not thinking straight. Those who seek revenge in such a cruel way often end up behind bars, and you don't want to go to jail unless it happens during a visit to your clients, isn't that right? The bartender gave Nick a sly look before he spoke. Nick nodded his thanks. Maybe I can help you with something, the bartender suggested. You were by my cousin's side when she needed help. She could have contacted me, but for unknown reasons, she didn't. 
you stepped in and helped her deal with the situation. Nick tried to intervene, explaining that he had just asked a friend to collect evidence and let the police do the rest. I also contacted a former assistant United States attorney from my firm to talk to the prosecutor and make sure that the criminal case is being handled correctly. I arrived with my client to make sure that the prosecutor was showing her the proper respect. Divorce was a simple matter after her husband's sentencing. Despite Nick's protests, the bartender brushed aside his concerns and said, helping simple people like my cousin is a noble thing in itself. My family owes you a debt, and I always repay my debts. I think you could use some help. Nick stared at him. I'm sorry, but I can't remember your name. The bartender's smile turned into a sinister grin. Some people know me as El Diablo. The devil? Nick asked. The bartender confirmed this with a nod. That's what my enemies call me. For friends, I'm Jose Garcia. Nick smiled back. What should I do to get mercy from the devil? Maybe I should sell my soul. El Diablo's grin faded. No one was smiling. Be serious. You're a lawyer, you don't have a soul. The smile returned, and Nick realized he was joking. Call it professional courtesy, send your Nick. Now just tell me your address, your wife's name, and her daily routine. What are your plans? I have a few ideas, but how do you like it? Ignorance is bliss. I think it's better to be in the dark and be able to report your location in the coming months. Buy a disposable phone so we can communicate and leave a number at this bar. After that, it's better if you don't come back here. It's better this way. Nick told El Diablo about his decision to hire a private investigator, about his intention to lie low until Linda left for France, and about the details of Linda's upcoming trip. El Diablo mentioned that he was familiar with one of the Paris hotels, but the source of his knowledge remained a mystery. Before parting, El Diablo asked Nick an important question. Is there any hope for reconciliation, forgiveness, or mercy in this situation? He made it clear that he didn't want Nick to change his mind later. When El Diablo looked straight into Nick's eyes, his smile faded, indicating the seriousness of the conversation. When he met Nick's gaze, his demeanor changed to serious. Taking a deep breath and reevaluating his emotions, Nick found clarity in his simple beliefs about trust and loyalty, which were the cornerstones of his character. These values eventually led to the destruction of his marriage. El Diablo leaned back in his chair, feeling calm. Relax, don't worry about anything, he reassured himself. When the waitress handed him the bill, El Diablo waved her away but asked Nick to tip generously. He also allowed Nick to take a bottle of tequila, warning him to take his time. A clear mind was necessary for the upcoming battle. Surprisingly, Nick woke up Sunday morning without much of a hangover and got to Harry's law office by 10 a.m. Frank was already there and apologetically said, Sorry, Nick. She definitely slept with that guy in your bed. He was there two hours after you called me, and he was still there when I left this morning. We have a high-quality video recording. I made you a copy, but you might not want to watch it. Harry intervened, warning, don't watch it. I don't want you to do something rash and get into trouble. Nick calmed him down by saying, don't worry, just tell me everything in detail. I followed your instructions and went up to the treehouse. Inside, I saw them huddled together and took clear pictures of their faces and bodies. It was obvious that they were making love, hardly talking to each other. It seems like it was a purely physical connection. I'm not sure if this information will affect your plans. They held out for a while, showing great endurance. I apologize for any possible discomfort you may have experienced. I know Linda from the party you hosted last year, so I can confirm that this is her. We checked this guy's license plates, and they belong to Wayne Martin. We know he's working with her. We are not sure about the duration of their relationship, but the evidence we have gathered seems quite convincing. In addition, we have a camera mounted on a nearby tree that records the actions in the driveway and in the garage, which allows us to monitor their movements. I will send you an email with a link to access the live broadcast on our secure server. After talking to Harry, I will prepare a report and a supporting affidavit for him. Sorry, dude, Frank said and shook hands with Harry and Nick before leaving the office. So what's the plan? Harry asked. File for divorce on the grounds of adultery, but we won't file today, Nick replied. Harry looked at Nick with a blank expression on his face. Trust me, Harry, these words alone make me feel sick. I don't want you to do anything rash. I foresee that everything will go much better than expected. 
Harry smiled grimly. Just file this on Monday afternoon before the court closes and give me the case number. I'll take care of the rest, Nick instructed. But remember, I'm not good at criminal law. If you need help to get out of trouble, I can't help you. You'll be pleasantly surprised, Nick added before leaving after meeting Sam Granger. Nick was thrilled with the news that they would be able to sell the house for more than $100,000 and without commission to the real estate agent. Linda would be thrilled if she found out about it. Nick promised that he would return soon with the necessary documents to complete the transaction. After leaving Sam's office, he checked his phone but found no messages or calls. She still seemed to be enjoying her time with Dwayne. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Nick called his boss, Sven, and informed him that he urgently needed a two-week vacation, otherwise, he would quit. Sven was taken aback and quickly agreed, realizing that Nick was very important for the current job. Fortunately for Sven, the business was experiencing a temporary downturn, which allowed him to satisfy Nick's request. Having put his plan into action, Nick headed back to the hotel to attend to the remaining work chores. By Monday evening, everything was ready. Linda left voicemails on both Sunday and Monday evening but received no reply. Nick concentrated on saving his strength for Thursday morning. With the help of Frank's camera, Nick was able to verify that Dwayne had indeed spent Monday night there. Knowing that Dwayne usually leaves around 8 in the morning, Nick planned to arrive at 7 o'clock. Just as Linda was about to leave at 8.30 a.m., Nick came into the house and shouted, I'm home. Linda was coming down the stairs in a bathrobe, looking disheveled and surprised. What a surprise, she exclaimed with mock cheerfulness, although there was clearly panic in her voice. I thought you weren't coming until Friday. I tried to call you, but I didn't get an answer, Nick replied casually. I'm sorry, but you know how it is. Nick ignored the two glasses of wine left in the living room and headed for the dining room. Linda watched him, wondering how to stop him from finding Dwayne upstairs. A knock on the door caught her off guard, and Nick asked her to open it. While Linda nervously opened the door, Nick fiddled with papers on the dining room table, pretending not to notice her agitation, perhaps waiting for the bait to arrive with the divorce papers. As soon as Linda opened the door, Maggie came into the house and just greeted her. Linda watched with interest as Maggie settled down at the dining table and unpacked her suitcase. I'm sorry, dear, Nick explained, but I'm not sure when I'll be back on the air. Considering your upcoming trip abroad, we should probably update your power of attorney in case of unforeseen financial or medical situations. It is useful to be prepared. Also, over the weekend, I found out about the favorable refinancing rate for my mortgage and decided it was better to take care of it while we both travel. Sorry for the urgency, he apologized. Linda turned to Maggie and asked, Who is this? when the artery in her temple stopped throbbing furiously. I'm Maggie, she replied. Nick explained that Maggie was a notary public, and Linda visibly relaxed when she heard the news, although her lover was still hiding upstairs. The situation hadn't gotten out of control yet. Are you always ready, my boy scout, for what? What is it? he asked with a grin, sitting down, although her eyes remained wary. I am who I am, honey, he replied, holding out his hand to Linda and spreading out the papers in front of her. The arrow flags indicate where to put the signature. Take your time and read the documents. I trust you, Linda said cheerfully and quickly signed all the papers in front of her. Nick silently prayed that she would do everything to the end, knowing what the consequences might be otherwise, but he remembered the saying, who takes risks wins. While Linda signed, Nick spread out the papers and handed them to Maggie, who notarized each one. Mrs. Buford, do you have a photo ID? Maggie asked. Linda got up from the table to get her purse. Maggie and Nick exchanged a knowing look, suppressing the urge to laugh, as Linda put her driver's license on the table. Maggie discreetly photographed them on her phone and wrote down the necessary data in her notary journal. Despite Linda's offer of coffee, Nick and Maggie politely declined while Maggie diligently certified the documents in her journal. Nick put everything in separate folders. When Maggie left, she put all her things away and smiled at Nick. When Linda turned her back on her, Nick kindly offered Linda a break, saying that he had a conference call and would be working in his office in the basement. Linda was relieved to realize that now she had time to discreetly help Dwayne leave and remove all evidence of his presence before Nick returned. Nick went downstairs, allowing Linda to believe that she had managed to deceive him. Ignoring Dwayne's heavy footsteps on the stairs and the garage door opening for her car, he pretended not to notice anything. 
but the sound of the shower running in the main bathroom made Nick quickly pack up all his things, leave through the door to the basement, and leave without saying a word to his wife. Two hours later, after a hearty breakfast at the diner, Nick found himself in Harry's office. Harry was visibly taken aback. Wait, so you're saying that you forced your wife to sign a 146-year form, confirming the filing of a divorce application, refusal to serve procedural documents, and notification of any future proceedings? How exactly what is it? he asked in disbelief. Yes, the certified form is here, Harry's shock only intensified. You also forced your wife, an experienced lawyer, to sign a property settlement agreement according to which all proceeds from the sale of their house, car, and jewelry went to you. An agreement that gave you the right to dispose of her personal belongings and allowed you both to leave with retirement accounts without any alimony for her. She still earned more than me. These documents also indicate that she is ready to get out of the marriage, having about $125,000 of her retirement savings and about $200,000 of student loan debt received at law school. Is it true she has always been known for her generous nature? Harry cast a sidelong glance at Nick and then returned his attention to the papers scattered on his desk. So, you forced her to sign an affidavit confessing to adultery with her lover in the marital bedroom at the time of signing and staying there all night after their meeting? Harry asked incredulously. Are you seriously trying to convince me that her affidavit confirms the accuracy of the statement in the email? What are you trying to tell me, a lawyer? Nick asked with a neutral expression. Please don't disrespect me, the evidence in these documents speaks for itself. Harry looked at the papers, then back at Nick, almost smiled, but then pulled himself together and turned away. Forget about it, I'll take over this case. As a respected member of the Bar Association and a friend from law school, I was unaware of all your actions. I thought it was all right, Your Honor. I am genuinely perplexed about the betrayal of trust on the part of my client. If anyone deserves to have their license revoked, it's Nicholas A. Buford. S. Your Honor. Do you understand what I'm getting at, Nick? Will this notary be able to confirm that Linda signed all this if necessary? Yes, she will be able to do it. Do you think she'll confirm that Linda has studied the documents carefully? I don't want to speculate or distort anyone's testimony, but given Linda's experience as a trial lawyer, I believe she has carefully studied the documents. The notary will most likely confirm that he saw Linda Buford looking through the documents and signing each of them. I cannot comment on the extent to which she understands the contents of the documents. All right, said Harry, today I will record all this along with Frank's affidavit and report with photos and on DVD. I will try to remove this from the electronic file for a while. We don't want this to make headlines, do we? Nick agreed, adding that Linda was leaving for Paris in a little over two weeks, so the longer we kept it a secret, the better. Harry asked if anyone knew anyone in the district court and mentioned Seth, a student who graduated from the university a year later than them and was trying to find a job at a law firm. He currently works as a clerk in the district court and is focused on writing a resume. He can speed up the process but if the judge demands live testimony, the situation may become insurmountable. Linda will have to accept that she may not want to continue the case if she understands its consequences. If things don't go well at this stage, I may have to give up my position as your lawyer. It seems reasonable, someday in the future, you will be able to share the whole story with me, but I'm not ready to listen to her right now. Over the next two weeks, Nick successfully kept Linda at a distance. He sent her messages at random times, claiming to be busy, and only occasionally answered her calls. The calls became less frequent every day. You really scared her, Frank informed him. By the end of the week, our videos show that Dwayne hasn't been in the house since you showed up unexpectedly on Tuesday morning. I do not know if they meet at his house during the week or make love in the office, but they do not do this at home. I'll let you know if anything changes. The only thing that changed was that Nick quietly returned to the house after he found out that Linda had left and took away the financial documents that he thought he might need. In addition, he signed a contract for the sale of the house with Sam Granger. The completion of the deal was scheduled for the first week of Linda's stay in France. Nick spent his evenings at the gym, and in his spare time, he read, reflecting on his chaotic life at the age of 30. He informed Sven that he needed a few more weeks of rest, to which Sven hesitantly agreed. She's enjoying his company at home again, Frank said on Saturday, just a week before Linda left for Paris. Thanks for the warning, Nick replied, indifferent but already thinking about burning the sheets rather than selling them when he eventually leaves the house. Nick had already watched the video that Frank had given him earlier. 
he understood what attracted her to him, Dwayne, who according to Frank, was several years younger, often went to the gym. He always started with a warm-up in front of the mirror and then took up the barbell. Otherwise, he looked completely normal. Mick was in pretty good shape too, although he definitely didn't have a six-pack. Linda was clearly striving for perfection, much to Nick's chagrin. Without hesitation, Linda went on a long-awaited trip to Paris. One of Frank's team members followed her to the airport unnoticed and stayed there until her plane took off for Europe. After hearing the news, Mick returned to the house, gathered all of Linda's things in a pile in the living room, and chose what he would like to leave. The next day, movers arrived to pack Linda's things into boxes and transport them to the warehouse. They packed Nick's things separately and transported them to the apartment they found, thanks to demolition specialist Sam Granger. Nick was able to quickly sell furniture from the house. When the house was cleared, Nick finally walked through the empty rooms. He collected the wedding photos, the album, and Linda's wedding dress, and took them to the bonfire in the yard under the treehouse. With meticulous care, Nick laid out the photos and album on the coals, added a dress, and splashed liquid for ignition, then lit a match. He watched as new photos were added to the stack and clearly saw unforgettable memories of their life together. The next day, Nick issued a power of attorney for the sale of the family home, allowing his wife to sign it on his behalf. She really should have read everything. She signed, having issued a separate financial power of attorney. Nick was able to put the proceeds from the sale of the house into his personal account, acting on behalf of his wife as her de facto representative. It also allowed him to close their joint accounts. Unfortunately, just three days later, when Linda was still at the very beginning of her trip to France, a construction crew demolished their house. The rubble was cleared within a few days, and work began on the preparation of a new site. But the tree, which provided shade and was an ideal place for children, had to be removed. A gazebo was put in a new place, and Nick and Linda's once happy house turned into just a large square of land. Construction suddenly stopped because there was a problem with obtaining a permit. Nick and his friend from law school, who worked in the district permits department, were optimistic, believing that the issue would be resolved soon after Linda's return from France when the necessary forms would be processed and approved. Throughout this time, Nick deliberately ignored all of Linda's attempts to contact him. He did not respond to her calls, texts, emails, and voicemail. When friends and family contacted him on behalf of Linda, Nick simply replied with a short message claiming that he was busy and on a business trip to avoid unwanted guests. El Diablo contacted him on a prepaid mobile phone. He mentioned that Linda and Dwayne looked tense and unwell, hinting that maybe Linda suspected something was wrong. When Nick asked how he knew this, El Diablo simply said that he had connections everywhere, even in Europe. El Diablo then asked Nick if he was ready to return Linda's wedding and engagement rings. Nick refused, and El Diablo suggested that someone else buy them instead. Nick flatly refused, but El Diablo mentioned that he might know a potential buyer of the rings. On Wednesday, just two days before Linda returned from Paris, Nick found himself in Harry's office. I can't believe it, but here's the divorce decision, he said, handing over the document. Seth, who was also present, remained silent. I don't want to know the details, Nick quickly added. Just consider yourself lucky and congratulate yourself on being single again. Harry then announced that he would send the final version of the document to Nick's ex-wife, expressing confidence that she would be pleased with the result. As Nick was heading to his car outside Harry's office, his phone rang. Although he did not recognize the number, he immediately realized from the distinctive voice on the other end that it was El Diablo. Nick, you need to rest, leave right now. Go to a place where there are many people who know you and can confirm your location, El Diablo advised, abruptly interrupting the conversation. Nick suddenly realized that it had been a long time since he had seen his college buddies who lived in New York. Fortunately, he didn't have any commitments in the coming days, which allowed him to go on a spontaneous trip. On the same day, he visited many exhibitions, several museums, and chatted with different groups of friends over food and drinks, using mainly his credit card for payment. He always left generous tips at the hotel, wanting to be recognized by the staff. During his stay at the hotel, he immediately sent a copy of the DVD, which shows him burning his ex-wife's wedding dress and album, to her parents by express mail. Late Sunday night, in Manhattan's Little Italy, Nick got a call from his father-in-law while he was enjoying coffee and cakes. Nick, where are you? Linda is going crazy, she's in the hospital, his father-in-law exclaimed. Nick asked what happened. 
His father-in-law explained that Linda returned from a trip on Friday and was abducted along with her colleague at the airport. They were found under the influence of illegal substances and released only this morning. Linda's colleague was severely beaten. Nick's father-in-law's voice trembled as he talked about how Linda, who Nick would once have shown compassion for, found herself in such a difficult situation. Linda woke up to a shocking discovery, she was completely covered in tattoos with disturbing inscriptions. Before she could figure out what was going on, a masked man entered the room and attacked her. Impressive, Nick thought. In fact, it was the cherry on the cake. On Sunday, he would have found satisfaction in the fact that Linda understood his betrayal, as well as the fact that she betrayed him in their marriage. It would be worth an immortal soul if he had one. I'm sorry to hear. That I'm away now. How can I help you? Nick felt the shock in the other's voice. You're her husband, she is your wife. I'm sorry, but that's not the case anymore. We finalized the divorce, and the court's decision was made only last week. She's having an affair with a man she's traveling with. What's going on here? Nick realized that he had been harsh, but he didn't care. I have a video recording of her intimacy with someone else, not with me. Would you like to see it? There was silence on the other end of the line. Nick wondered if his father-in-law had had a heart attack. We broke up with her, so you'll have to take her home. It doesn't concern me anymore. Did you do that? His father-in-law shouted. I've been in New York since Wednesday, celebrating my divorce. Look, I know you're upset, and I hope Linda gets better soon, but I don't think we have anything to talk about. With that, he hung up the phone. At that moment, Nick realized that the stress of city life had become unbearable. He wrote Sven a letter expressing his disappointment and, in the end, with all due respect, told Sven and the firm to go to hell. After a short search on the internet, Nick found the REI store in Soho and decided to buy new equipment for hiking and camping. Linda, who had never been a fan of hiking, saw this as an opportunity to reconnect with her past related to working in intelligence. The hotel kindly agreed to keep his luggage for a small fee, allowing him to travel to the Adirak Mountains to find solace in nature until things calmed down. He took his passport with him in case he had the opportunity to leave for Canada. For the next eight weeks, he barely paid attention to his phone. At first, he suspected that some abnormal woman had taken his ex-wife's phone because there were many messages, perhaps hundreds, filled with seemingly frantic pleas and tears. He listened to only a few and deleted the rest, along with a bunch of crazy emails. Her account must have been hacked. It seemed impossible to find the time to read it all. He hoped that the woman would ask for the help she needed. Eight weeks later, Nick met Frank for a drink, and Harry joined them. Harry explained that their relationship with the lawyer ended as soon as the decision to divorce was made, which he notified Nick by registered mail. Nick admitted that he hadn't checked his email yet. It's a big storm, my friend, Harry remarked. What do you think, Frank? More like a typhoon, don't you think? Frank nodded in agreement. Definitely, the destruction is incredible. Harry quickly finished his bourbon and signaled for another one. Go on, Frank, he said. On Monday morning, the former Mrs. Buford arrived at her former home with her parents. The external camera, forgotten in the chaos, remained in place. When she saw the empty lot where her house once stood, she was overwhelmed by emotions and had a complete breakdown. Falling to her knees, she began to sob uncontrollably, curled up in a ball. Her breakdown intensified, she kicked and screamed like a child who had caused a scandal at the mall. The appearance of a team of workers with equipment only spurred her rampage. Her composure was shaken again when the construction workers noticed the tattoo on her face and burst out laughing despite the signs of physical violence, raccoon eyes and a patch on her broken nose. She couldn't control herself. Harry intervened to continue the story. In the afternoon, she arrived at my small office with several lawyers from her prestigious firm, who looked very intimidating. Since they didn't have an appointment, I made them wait for 25 minutes. I discreetly made sure that my Glock was loaded and lay within reach on my desk. Fortunately, we were in Virginia. When they finally entered, they were all shouting about urgent petitions, lawyer complaints, and contempt proceedings. It was hard for me to focus on their words as well as look away from the tattoos covering her face. The text was clearly highlighted in red and blue ink so that it could be seen from afar. As soon as I got my attention back, I asked what exactly it was about and which statement was not true. There was silence, and everyone exchanged glances. 
then I asked if there was any disagreement about your ex-wife's accusation of adultery, to which everyone confirmed while they were waiting in. I turned on a video I had prepared, which showed Linda in the marital bed bouncing on someone who was not her husband. It was obvious that they had not yet read all the case files, confusion was reflected on their faces when Linda began to shout that she had not been given the opportunity to explain herself. I told her the reason didn't matter, she did it anyway. Finally, she calmed down and admitted that she had not consented to the sale of the house and asked why her wedding dress photos and album were burned. All these things belonged to her personally. I gave her copies of the power of attorney, one of which authorized the sale of the house. I also showed her the property sharing agreement which gave you the right to dispose of her personal property as you see fit and mentioned that she was lucky to have clothes left. I asked if she disputed that the signature on the documents belonged to her. She replied in the negative but stated that she did not agree with the contents of the documents. Then I asked if her defense was based on the fact that she never checked what she was signing. I asked her to think about how she would behave under cross-examination if she challenged any details in court. After my remarks, she fell silent. In addition, I raised the issue of her signed affidavit, which stated that her lover was present upstairs during the signing. I asked about the authenticity of this statement. At the moment when she lost consciousness, her group was trying to revive her, and I quickly dialed the emergency number. Despite their efforts, she stubbornly refused to go to the hospital. Suddenly, she started screaming about tattoos and that her lover had been attacked. I assured her that the situation had nothing to do with you, especially since you were out of town. Most likely, Dwayne angered someone, perhaps a jealous spouse or a woman who felt threatened by Linda's relationship with him. I informed them so they know the location of the Fairfax Police Department in case they need to discuss a criminal case. Harry then noted that the situation had taken a positive turn as they continued to discuss filing a motion for reconsideration. At this point, I mentioned that I received an anonymous letter this morning containing links to videos of Linda and Duane lying in bed together before going to Paris. The message contained a threat to send the video to all of Linda's contacts, claiming that Nick did not know about it and could not prevent it. The sender mentioned friends whom Nick had helped before, promised protection, but warned of imminent actions if Linda did not back down. Do you have any information about this? I wasn't at home when it happened. They left, and I haven't heard from them since, and nothing has happened at the courthouse, Frank continued. Most likely they contacted Ed. The police and a couple of detectives arrived at the scene. They requested copies of the videos and the report but soon lost interest in them. Linda and Duane couldn't provide much information about what happened, all they knew was that they took a taxi from the airport and the next thing Duane remembered was that he woke up in the hospital. Linda ended up in a rundown hotel, was attacked, and then went to the hospital. Her credit card was charged for the room, room service, and minibar. Nick informed him that the hotel manager mentioned that the NYPD had checked his stay at the hotel and contacted his friends who confirmed that he had a very active work schedule in the city. Harry assumed that his ex was rumored to be hiding in her parents' basement where she was getting laser tattoo removal. The problem is that they charge depending on the size of the tattoo, that covers her entire body. It will cost a considerable amount, and the traces will remain forever, Nick said. Harry looked at Nick, and Frank stifled a laugh. What's more important than a lover? Harry asked. I heard that he suffered serious injuries, and he will need long-term physical therapy. He has several concussions and a damaged head. It will probably be difficult for him to find a new job as a paralegal since their firm fired them too. Apparently, their relationship soured during the trip which eventually had a negative impact on the arbitration proceedings due to insufficient preparation, in particular, the lack of documents and objections, as well as problems with witnesses. They eventually lost the case. This led to the fact that the client was dissatisfied, and the company was forced to make personnel changes in order to retain the client for future projects, Frank remarked. Someday Nick, you're going to have to tell us how you handled this situation, Frank remarked. I'm a boy scout, Nick replied. Maggie was waiting for him in the car when he got out.